Hey, what's going on, y'all? Hey. Feeling all right? Yeah. All right, so I like to hear. Let's start this thing off right. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. This has uh, been a amazing journey for me to, to get to this place. And as somebody who has had a lot of Oregonians in my life over the last uh, eight years, they've always told me that Bend is one of the best places on earth. So here I am, right? <laughs> That's what they said. I swear to God. Um, so again, my name is Brian C. Lee Jr. Um, I am an architect and designer out of New Orleans, Louisiana. And uh, I'm a military kid, as you just heard. So I've traveled uh, quite a bit, and it's shaped and formed how I view the world. Um, in that, I have focused my efforts on something called design justice. And so that's what I'll talk to you a little bit about today, a little bit about the framing of how that came about, uh, what it means for me personally, uh, and how maybe it can, can uh, speak to you as designers as well. So, Ultimately, fundamentally, architecture and design tells a story of place. And that language, the nuance and the language we use to tell that story of place is super significant. It can tell us about our values and ideals, but it can also reveal the injustices, the, bias, the biases that we have in the world. And so we as designers have to be very conscious of the way in which we use that language uh, to speak to the, the people within a, a world. So, I'm going to tell you my story of place. As you just mentioned, as you just heard, uh, I grew up as a military kid, traveled a lot. About every two to three years, I would move to a different place. Um, when I was seven to 10, uh, my mother was stationed in, in Comiso. Um, true fact, the uh, Comiso was a base that was set up during the first Iraq war uh, to kind of house all the, the nuclear missiles. Didn't know that at the time, but you know, here I am. Um, so this was a place that formed uh, a lot of who I am. I used to remember walking around the, the plazas and, and meeting the people, shaking hands. Uh, and, and as you heard, I came back and moved to Trent, New Jersey, where my grandmother was, which is this, this second little uh, dot right here. Um, this is the bodega at the corner. I'm three houses in. And it looks a lot smaller now, but when I was young, I used to walk up and down these steps. It was like a three stories high. The, the width of the hallway was about two feet wide. It was like the minimum you can have as a, <laughs> uh, dur during for uh, building codes. And I would walk up and down, walk up and down, and it would terrify me at night. There were no lights, nothing. But the bigger thing that I noticed was that my grandmother was hurting, like her legs would hurt as she went up and down these stairs. And so I finally, again, asked, what does that mean? Why, why do I feel this way in this space versus the way that I felt when I was skipping around uh, Sicily, right? There's a different feeling there. Uh, and so my parents urged me, and I don't know if this was, was a means to just have me go draw off to the side or not, but they urged me to think about designing. I was already somebody who, who liked to sketch a lot and designing a house for, for my grandmother. And so that's what I set out to do. Um, so my grandmother passed away about six months ago, uh, I guess October, yeah, so about six months ago now. And it was devastating as you'd expect. And I remember how everything that happened for me in life after this point, after she lived in this house, was a derivative of those moments in that place, right? So there's a social connection to place that is evident in how we define our, 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 the spaces we exist within. When she passed away, my aunt, she wanted to play this song at my, at my uh, grandmother's funeral called I'm Blessed by Charlie Wilson. And we were all kind of like, okay, whatever, aunt. Go ahead, do your thing, uh, live your life, and, and we'll get through it. Everybody's crying at the funeral. It's a mess. And we get through it. And about three weeks later, I'm in a meeting. I'm in the middle of like, you know, I just started my business. And so um, I'm in the middle of a meeting. And this song comes on. I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. And I fall out. I'm like, oh. <laughs> like, can't hold myself together in the middle of one of my, my first design meetings. And so this in itself speaks to this larger context. And, I, and I, I tell this story because I always say architecture is the hardware to the software of life, and art and culture is the user interface. It's the way we rationalize the complex spaces and places that we interact with through our lives, right? And so we have to understand that if we don't understand our culture, whatever that culture may be, with, with, within whatever community we're serving, we are at a loss. We're doing the wrong 
So again, social life connects to the architecture, connects to the arts and culture. And this is what that looks like. It's inextricably linked, right? So there are, all of that lead, led me to this kind of overwhelming thought process that kind of defines my practice and defines how I go about the work that I do. And it's called design justice. Design justice speaks to the public interest design, the social impact design. This is a radical form of thinking about the ways in which design can have implicit, uh, have implications on the development of place and space. And it's really about how we eliminate the privilege and power structures that use architecture and design as a means to, to perpetuate injustice or oppression within the built environment. And if we can understand the ways in which design does that, if we can understand the language we're using that's not speaking to the cultural inheritance of place, then we can actually start to do things that, that make changes, that make real substantive cultural uh, impact in place. It's also about how do we stratify the profession. Oftentimes, specifically in communities of color, there is a way in which design is inaccessible. And if you don't have an education that leads you to this path, if you don't have opportunities and access along that path line to do these, this, this type of work, uh, you're kind of exiled from, from the work we do long term. And so how do we continue to add people to the profession over time is really a huge uh, opportunity for us. So I frame us in a few different, and I'll just kind of take one little sidestep real quick. Most of my presentation is like metaphors and quotes, so deal with it. Um, <laughs> so this is a quote by Whitney M. Young. Um, and, and what strikes me is, and it's still to this day prevalent within the design profession uh, proper, you are a profession that's most distinguished by your thunderous silence and your complete, complete irrelevance. So after mod modernism, we, we, we gave this grandiose idea about what utopian space might look like. And we tried and we failed miserably. I mean, we, it's like an utter failure, right? And so we stepped away completely. But that wasn't the right move. The right move was to be more deliberate about the research, about the data, about how we interact with cultures. And if we do that, we can be vocal in ways that we've never been able to be before. And so that's what I always encourage uh, those that I speak to, to to continue doing. Be vocal all the time. Speak to the things that are true injustices and look at how buildings and spaces manifest those injustices. The Baldwin test is another one. The Baldwin test for you is really let's think about the ways in which um, power and privilege manifest. And so the quote here is we can work together, we can disagree and still work together, as long as your disagreement is not rooted in my, um, in my oppression or the denial of my humanity, right? If it's not rooted in somebody's oppression or the denial of their humanity, then we can have a conversation. Outside of that, there's no need for us to actually start to dive down that range because it creates a false parallel that, is, that does no justice for us long term. The other one is perhaps home is not a place but simply an irrevocable condition. Now, oftentimes, I speak to what culture is. As a frame for myself, uh, I say that culture is the consequence of persistent circumstance and existing condition. Persistent circumstance and existing condition. It is about habit and frequency and tendency. And those are the things that actually frame how we create our coping mechanisms, right? And those coping mechanisms turn into the art, the culture itself, right? That's actually how we do that. And so those forces right, the irrevocable condition tells us how we end up in certain spaces. It's why, given all of these other equality-based uh, conditions, we still see injustice or we still see inequity uh, when we try to resolve things in that fashion. This is, I'm going to point you to a few things here, but this is just what does it mean for us to, to root ourselves in a few definitions? Uh, one, I just gave you culture, consequence of uh, persistent circumstance and immediate condition. But the other one is systemic racism versus uh, prejudice or, or bigotry. Right? There is, there's an individualized or a one-to-one -one conversation that's around prejudice or racism that oftentimes overwhelms conversations that really should be left at the level of systemic injustice. Those things that have embedded uh, into our environment over that time and create uh, injustice regardless of whether or not we, we are uh, imploring equity or equality in the moment. It's the things that have been deep-seated over 200, 300, 400 years that are irrevocable. It's an irrevocable condition, right? 
Uh, and then the other thing, uh, I'm an activist and an advocate. Uh, oftentimes, I, would, I remember being in rooms where we would be setting up a protest. I remember seeing the news, and the news would always say, uh, we're preparing for a riot. Or if you saw a few years ago in Baton Rouge, the police came out in full riot gear and beat protesters, and this after the Alton Sterling uh, uh, murder. And so it always twisted my mind to think about the fact that we are actively in these spaces seeking peace and justice. And for some reason, the avenue is to say that we are rioters. And so honestly stepping into the shoes, understanding what it looks like and what it feels like to be in that space is to our benefit. And I always say that, that design can serve as protest for a reason, because uh, protest is about hope. It is fundamentally about an unyielding faith in the power of a just society, in the power of, of a community that can come together and create equity long term. So in that, how does that manifest in the kind of systems? What is systems-based? work look like. Uh, as designers, we can look at any of these, right? We can look at pedagogy, policy, procedure, practice, um, projects, and people. Anything along that line, we can kind of imbue our work into. And if we actively understand where, where our silos are, then we actually can do a lot more, right? We fundamentally stay in projects and practice oftentimes. Sometimes we veer into people, um, but we oftentimes never work up the chain. And this came to me working as the Place and Civic Design Director for the Arts Council. We had to try to manipulate, uh, that's on camera, right? We didn't manipulate you. We did, we had a great conversation about how we could, could make better policy and procedures. That's what we did. Um, so we actually worked with the city to look at policies and procedures that were out of date, that were not being uh, used in an appropriate manner, and allowed us to, to serve uh, our community better. And so the, what that did was allow us to organize and set up community efforts uh, at, a, at a higher, faster, more efficient, more effective, more equitable way long term. And so we have this mechanism within the AIA. We don't necessarily use it. I oftentimes ask people what health and safety mean uh, relative to the architectural profession. And that's fairly clear for people. Um, but almost never do people understand what the welfare component actually says within the definition. Uh, it specifically talks about the demonstrably positive emotional and physical response among, uh, among people uh, within a space, right? Positive emotional Right? Like it not only has a, a direction, right? Like it's, a, it's, a, it's an opportunity and it has a direction to it. It is a force to be reckoned with. And we should be thinking about this as the means and the way in which we can actually change procedure. So if we look at this chart and we say, okay, well, there's procedure. This is the way the AI carries out things. We don't actually do a bunch within the welfare component. Uh, so here's a way that we can do that. So I want to point to about 10, uh, 15 other critical points along a line. I'm not going to talk about all of these, but I encourage you to snap a picture, look at these in depth, but I'll run through them uh, a little bit quickly. So uh, the black codes after the Emancipation Proclamation uh, essentially said there is no more slavery unless you are a criminal. Well, the black codes essentially said black people are criminals. That's, that's essentially what, what they did. And so throughout the South, you saw policies and codes that started to define the actions and acts of people of color uh, as, as criminality. And in doing so, allowed those quote unquote felons to be put back into a system of, of slavery uh, over that time. And so that system is what we see today as the kind of prison industrial complex, right? And so we have to acknowledge our past if we want to actively seek to make changes in the future. Uh, Plessy versus Ferguson, it kind of kept our segregation. Euclid versus Ambler, setting our modern day uh, system of zoning in the United States, which expanded and extracted resources from city cores and started to elevate them within particular zones and regions. It means that you had to have resources to get more resources. Um, Again, we talked about Bauhaus, we talked about modernism quickly. Uh, the Federal uh, um, Housing Authority, which created redlining. In 1937, you started to see the ways in which we uh, gave loans and insurance to people throughout, um, throughout the country. And the way those maps actually worked were, how do we define who we want to give insurance and loans to? Well, we do it based on the color of their skin, right? And that 
kind of cataloged and stayed uh, over time. Now, these small acts started to increase inequity over time. Uh, at that point in time, you saw maybe a two to three to one ratio in terms of economic wealth or social wealth between black and white families over that time. And it's now eight to one, some give or take. Um, and then quickly, project housing, Levittown, an all-white suburb in New York, federal housing acts, slum clearance, which actually just wiped out all of the buildings that they actually put people in back in the day in the, in the 30s, uh, SEPTED acts, federal highway acts, which cut through a lot of uh, corridors of, of communities of color, uh, and then at the housing and urban development um, HUD office now, which has a, a, a not so great uh, person in, uh, heading that right now. <laughs> um, uh, um, so these are things to look at. I want you to kind of consider what that looks like in, in uh, action as well. So again, this talks about the prison industrial complex. This talks about how, again, the 13th Amendment asked for us to consider slavery to be null unless somebody is, is, is forcibly uh, a, a felon. This talks about the, the incarceration rate over time. Um, this is out in Sterling on the left-hand side and Eric Garner in New York, both murdered in front of convenience stores. Talks specifically about the fact that uh, the value that we place on certain types of spaces. See, that convenience store that was on the, the first page that I showed you, that was my convenience store outside of my grandmother's house where I went and got iced tea and crimpets, which is like this little cupcake thing, uh, every day. Uh, and so these places are significant. Whether or not we value them aesthetically as designers or not, they have value. Uh, and so. Alton Sterling spent five years out in front of this convenience store, uh, was shot in front of it for selling CDs. It's called vagrancy. That was the vagrancy law, right? That was what we had in place for the black codes. The vagrancy laws in um, the black codes in 1866, which you see at the bottom, are essentially uh, spouting the same thing as the 2011 uh, revision of vagrancy laws in Louisiana. So over that time, not a lot has changed and we still ask the same things of our police force when it comes to vagrancy. Uh, we see the same thing for desegregation, Plessy versus Ferguson. A lot of these things are rooted in New Orleans, and that's why I show a lot of them. But I want to show you what it looks like when we do these things in practice. Uh, so the Design Justice Platform is a program that came out of uh, Design as Protest, which is a conference I held uh, about 2015. It was a part of this National Organization of Minority Architects Conference in New Orleans, Louisiana. And what we did was we asked community members, activists, and the like to come together and speak specifically about what injustices were prevalent within their own communities, uh, who were, uh, who were disproportionately impacted by those injustices, how did it manifest in the built environment, and then ultimately, what was the design outcome that we wanted to see manifested from our work? Now, this is not to say that design is the only or the highest solution to every problem. It is, it is to say that we do play a part, and we are culpable uh, in certain aspects. And we should recognize that, and we should own up to it. Uh, we can't just pass it off every single time. So what did that look like? Again, to protest is to have an unyielding faith in the potential for a just society. Design, at its best, should have that character. We asked over 75 people to come through uh, and do this, this activity. And this led to about seven other projects out of that. And I'll talk to you a little bit about what those look like afterwards. But bringing advocates and activists from a community together to have this conversation, A, it put people who are already thinking about public space and who are already thinking about the justice of public space in a room with designers in a way that actually allowed us to translate, to be translators rather than dictators, right? So out of that came a larger program um, on January 20th, for some reason, of last year, um, that was really about um, having a national conversation. What did we see that was going to expand um, the levels of injustice over time? And the way in which we actually had this conversation, we had about 600 plus people from across the country uh, come together in rooms, rooms in, in small towns and big cities and ask those same four questions. Uh, the questions being, again, what's the injustice? Who does it directly or disproportionately impact? Um, how does it manifest in the built environment? And what's the outcome of the design change you're expecting? Um, that's what those questions look like. 
So we ask people to think about this along a design continuum, all the way from individual and ephemeral, all the way to collective and permanent. And the reason we ask this is because we have people who are community members in a room who are a little bit terrified of us, right? Like they just are not always in the same space as us. And so when we ask people to try to design something uh, outside of their range, uh, we are actually creating a barrier to access this content. And uh, what we want to do is respect their, their knowledge. There are PhDs in, in other particular fields that can have value to the work we do. We just have to allow them uh, that, that social value in place. So I'll give you a few quick examples of what that looked like. This is an immigration reform set that we show as example. Uh, one is a really quick individual ephemeral. Somebody created a, a quick uh, projection slide, put that up uh, on a Trump building in New York. Uh, this is the taco truck, if you look straight up um, on your right-hand side. Uh, the wall of taco trucks was ephemeral, but it was collective. The Fernando Romero piece, which is border city, which allowed us to actually think about a binational city um, and start conversations. Whether this happens or not is not necessarily the point. The point is that the conversation can be had about a binational city that would literally uh, be able to support every uh, migrant person in this, in this country. Every single person. So as you're going through your process of migration, you actually have a place that respects your humanity, does not speak to oppressive nature or injustice, and allows you to live a life that has dignity uh, associated with it. Same thing can be said for the Elemental House. Uh, this is a project I worked on in New Orleans called Blights Out for President. We're doing one that's called Blights Out for Mayor right now, but essentially talking specifically about uh, injustices in the built environment through the language of, of presidential campaigns, through the language of um, uh, mayoral campaigns. So what does that look like for individual projects? There's a project called Paper Monuments. And over the last two and a half years, um, we have been looking to take down racist Confederate monuments in the city of New Orleans. That has been a two and a half year fight on top of uh, a 30 year fight on top of another 30 year fight. These are generations old conversations. And there's no reason that we should, as a city, as a nation, be holding on to a timeline that was never true, right? I, I always talk, talk about these conversations as though uh, we are in a fight, in a battle to retain a timeline that should be true to who this country is. And oftentimes when we hold up and we elevate and we lionize spaces and places that talk about a history that doesn't exist or that was not valorized or that is valorized for a reason that is, is not correct, then we are actually holding to an alternative timeline that does not do us any justice. These are the folks that helped us start this um, in New Orleans. Over that time, we had a, a white linen night action, which is uh, a, a gallery hopping evening in New Orleans. And that action held a count, Robert E. Lee, who never came to New Orleans. And we told his entire history. We talked about every slave he owned. We talked about um, the, the, the dehumanization that he put and pervade into this world and the fact that he had never been to the city and asked us the question, why are we valorizing? Why are we lionizing somebody who has done so much harm to our city? It doesn't mean we erase history. It means that we acknowledge its totality and then make a, make a, a better decision. So we often talk about uh, the right side of history and the wrong side of history. Um, during our takedown, we took down four of these over the last couple of years. And, you know, as the, as the wrong side of history lost battle after battle, we got happier and happier. And so on the day of the final takedown, we saw people jump roping in the street, drinking uh, you know, gas station wine for days. Uh, um, it's fantastic. Um, but it was really beautiful. And so out of that came this conversation around how do, we, how do we elevate stories that have been crushed by the weight of these other uh, people in our space over that time. And so we created a project called Paper Monuments that went on to tell uh, 30, 40 stories at this point in time that will tell over 200, 300 stories by the time we're done. And the intention is really, this is our 300th year. We want 300 stories that define New Orleans in its best light. Uh, we ask people to, to, we ask artists to connect with storytellers, and those storytellers brought to light what that might look like long term. <clears throat> 
These are just some of the posters that uh, you might see. Um, we have actions that are based in um, street kind of engagement as well as storytelling events, public proposals, and future large-scale murals and uh, story or project, which is a physical embodiment of those stories that we've told at that time. So by the end of next year, we expect to have a solid conversation about how we put in place all of these, uh, these stories and, and lift them to a higher position. I'm running, so I'm gonna give you one little last story about how it works in practice, and then I'll, I'll step off here. But this is the Claiborne Innovation District. I wanna tell you a little bit of story about this. This is one of those highways that cut through uh, the city. Essentially, we were asked to work with uh, the community in an organizing fashion to make sure that this corridor was brought back to life. And so we used the existing mechanisms that, that were in place to do so. We used the festivals as a means to do design engagement. So it wasn't about us doing um, middle of the room, six o'clock afternoons. This was, let's go to where people are and let's have that conversation. And so we asked people to join us to build things in place to make sure that uh, they had their hands on the change itself. We asked them to give us their notes and thoughts and conversations tell us their stories, tell us, use their, their uh, knowledge to kind of guide us in the right directions. The elders we asked to remember uh, and solidify some of those older stories. Artists we asked to think about how they want to engage in this space long term, whether that's through murals or physical spaces. The youth we asked to tell us what the future looks like. We did a fundamental large scale report on this and we started to design a space that spoke to all of those, those needs. And so the last thing I'll read just to, to kind of wrap this up, I started this by saying stories are important and language is important. Language is important because uh, architecture is a language and architecture like all languages allows us to tell a story because stories are important. Buildings tell stories and diverse stories come from diverse cultures because guess what, culture is important. And culture is the consequence of persistent circumstance and existing condition in our cities, our neighborhoods, our blocks incubate that culture. And for people of color, specifically in this, uh, this country, there's power in the places and spaces uh, where our culture is recognized, where our stories are told, and where our language is valued. Because that is not only good design, that's justice. Thank you. Appreciate it. Brian Lee. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Um, I'm, su I'm supposed to stand at the podium, but honestly, that feels weird. Maybe we should just sit down for a second. Let me, you got, you got it? All right, cool. Um, I, we could talk about this all day, right? I, I was so um, taken by the point in your, when, when you were talking about how you have to understand a place's culture if you're going to start to talk about its spaces. Yeah. And, okay, so the story of Central Oregon went through this seismic shift in the late 20th century. The story of Central Oregon used to be timber. Mm -hmm. And now it's people having fun, right? Large, that's yeah. a large yeah. part of yeah. what, what shapes our spaces. So, I like, the, the, yeah. you know, what that, what that gives you, what that leads to is that a great deal of Bend and Central Oregon has, ha, has been rebuilt to produce beautiful spaces that people love. Mm -hmm. The market cannot get enough of these spaces but at the same time, the spaces are completely unaffordable mm -hmm. to people who have lived here all their lives. Yeah. And it's, it's, a, it's a market that's driven largely by out-of-state money. Yeah. How do you address a tidal wave of design that is highly, highly appealing, but which carries consequences for so much of the community? Yeah, so I think it's about kind of creating uh, an understanding of all the ways in which equity and capital are, are created in the world, right? So there's financial capital that drives pretty much everything we do, right? But there's social, there's time, and there's knowledge. And if we can have the almost the exchange rate that talks about the ways in which the social capital is valued in place, you're actually able to counteract some of the decision-making that's based purely on, on a capitalistic drive. It doesn't mean that capitalism's not going anywhere, y'all. Just... just being, being honest, um, but, but social capitalism, knowledge capitalism, time capitalism should elevate themselves. So I think the, the, the answer is really 
we've got to find a way to quantify the social, the knowledge, and the time in a way that, that does better for us. One more question. Yeah. Oregon has so much beautiful design, but it yeah. often presents this facade that the horse is really out of the barn in terms of justice. Mm -hmm. The timeline that you laid out of, of historic events that influence design and you know, laid this groundwork for oppression, mm -hmm. we could talk about Oregon's history of mm -hmm. oppression and the fact that there were laws keeping black people out of the state mm -hmm. in, the, you know, in the early part of the 20th century. When we're not talking about revitalizing or bolstering community spaces, but we're talking about a change that that would have to that would have to penetrate this facade that's been built on uh, you know, on privilege for so long. How does that change the game for the design conversation? Yeah, yeah, it's it's hard because it's hard for us to own our privilege um, because we because we experience a wide range of things, right? Like we experience all of the defeats and the heartaches that sometimes don't allow us to see the privilege that we do have in front of us. And that's an individual thing that has to happen. But I think really the conversation has to be taken out of self and into, um, into the community at a larger way. So if we, can, if we can manage to understand our privilege as a larger community, then, then we can start to make decisions that are not individually driven. Uh, and I think that's where we start to, to, to do better for, for all people. It has to be a community conversation around privilege. And until that happens, uh, we're going to keep making bad decisions in, in, the, in the effort to create equality and not equity. And I think that's like really, really vital to understand that there's, we can be equal in this moment, but you know, for 100, 200, 300 years, there has been an, an injustice that, that puts me in the stage in a different way. Brian Lee of Co-Locate. This Thank is great. You. Thank you. Thank you so much.